you're watching Whole Foods Whole Health by Dr. Lisa Gall on Resonance Wellness TV, part of our Whole Life Medicine Alleviate series. Keep in the loop about future webinars and events on whole-life-medicine.com. Good evening and welcome to my monthly webinar series for our patient community and hopefully a little bit beyond. Um, tonight's webinar is Whole Foods and Whole Health. And today we're going to be talking about the plant-based whole foods diet and what it's been shown to do for your health. Um, our lecture tonight is going to focus on points from the perspective of, of alleviate from the whole life medicine model, which is the first step in health strategy at resonance. Alleviate is basically the first step in my approach to patient guidance. So today we're going to look at the topic of diet which is obviously a major underpinning of your health. In short, there's three considerations when we're looking at strategies to resolve a health issue and alleviate. The first is to consider what the root causes are in our health situations individually and ask ourselves, what's the setup? So diet is a chief lifestyle intervention in any natural health plan for both prevention and treatment of disease. And when we make changes to diet, we really affect how things are set up to operate biologically. The second step is to look at the state of the tissues involved. And in the clean slate process, we look at how to improve the cleaning up of the tissues that get bogged down, um, basically in the tissue maintenance um, process. With dietary intervention, you're gonna see improved maintenance of all body tissues and much better tissue cleanup. And lastly, the diet is the best place to obtain missing ingredients for all metabolic and repair in your body. And so the quality and nature of what you're eating plays a huge role. So with those thoughts in mind, we're gonna dive in. Um, and if I see, I'm, I'm seeing some questions already coming up on the chat box. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, if I can answer them within the presentation, I will do that. And if not, I will answer them at the end, but hopefully I will answer most people's questions uh, within the context of what we're gonna talk about. So let's start and just take a look at some of the language that we're using in whole um, foods, plant-based applications. So whole foods are considered to be foods that are consumed in their whole state. That means they're literally whole, unrefined, or very, very minimally refined ingredients. So a whole food wouldn't technically include a flour, or a refined sweetener or a pressed oil. Plant-based means food that comes from plants and it doesn't contain any animal ingredients. So no animal ingredients like meat or milk or eggs or even honey um, is considered an animal product. So as a consequence, a whole foods plant-based diet is actually a lifestyle that's based on eating mostly plants. It excludes or really drastically reduces or eliminates animal products and processed highly refined foods, including the flour and the sugar and the oils, like I said before. This is the approach that we're specifically discussing today. The term vegan describes a lifestyle that excludes as far as possible all animal products for food clothing or any other purpose. So when people um, say that they're vegan. In theory, that is um, a lifestyle that negates the use of any animal product in any application. Um, so again, you know, fish, dairy, eggs, honey, the whole nine yards. Vegetarian is more widely known as a lifestyle, and that excludes foods that consist of or have been produced with the aid of products of any, again, living or dead animal. So meat, poultry, fish, insects. However, a lot of vegetarians will typically eat dairy and eggs. So they eat products um, that are like produced by animals, but not are not of an animal. A pescatarian is somebody who eats a vegetarian diet and adds in fish. Um, lots of people eat like that at this point. And to be omnivorous means consuming foods that are both plant and animal origin. Human beings are really thought to have developed to be omnivores biologically, but the diet of humans obviously varies markedly in different places in the world. So it's interesting to contrast this to animals, which are typically limited by food distributions. Human beings really aren't at this point. Well, some human beings are, but those in the, in the Western world really aren't. And to be carnivorous means you, you eat mostly meat. And humans technically are not carnivores, but they can eat like they are. So why are we talking about a plant-based diet? Statistically, 
Eating a plant-based diet reduces your risk of many diseases. It doesn't completely eliminate the risk, of course, because there are other factors in the production of health, and that includes your activity level, your social balance, your community involvement, a lot of factors that we cover more when we move into the aligned segment of whole life medicine. But we can't ignore well-performed research. It really, there's a lot of scientific evidence that many chronic diseases can be controlled, reduced, or even reversed by moving to a whole food plant-based diet. In my practice, I see patients for the most part, they're pretty conscious of what they do and don't eat. Many people have made the move to organic foods. They've made the move to decrease their meat consumption and to include more fruits and vegetables. Where they struggle is with getting out of the box in terms of what a meal looks like and um, changing that with respect to how they grew up eating. Most people have grown up with a meat and starch based plate with some veggies kind of thrown in for color. And there are historical and social reasons for this. We have to remember that Canadians eat a diet that resembles the diet of the most privileged people in history, three meals a day, 365 days a year. You can obtain food out of season that's shipped in from all over the world. You eat the rarest substances in nature on a daily basis, in particular on the sugar end and oil end. To bring this diet to you requires a massive food production distribution system. So as a result, people often eat too much of what doesn't really support health. And when we calculate out what someone is actually eating on a daily basis, many people are really surprised to learn they're habitual eating twice what they actually need in calories alone. And with a nutrient balance, that's really not appropriate for weight balance or disease resolution. So ironically, the places in the world with the most longevity, the diet usually looks quite different. And in some days, in some ways, sorry, it looks more restricted to us because it doesn't include some of our most familiar f foods like meat or bread. Bread's a very common one here. In the 70s and 80s though, there was joint research by the Chinese Academy of Preventative Medicine, Cornell University, which is on the East Coast, and the University of Oxford in England. And that showed that a plant-based diet can reduce the risk of type two diabetes, of heart disease, of certain types of cancer, and other very significant illnesses. And a book by one of those Cornell researchers um, was called the China Study. It outlines these findings. It's been probably one of the most read nutritional books in North America. And in that book, he extensively goes through what they found in their studies and what they think it implies um, for, for people's health. So these are huge claims. I mean, the research done in that landmark study has really been the basis of a lot of studies since. They were really one of the first groups to, to systematically study what that could look like in a big set of populations. So let's just look at three categories of benefits that are really known to come from eating a plant-based diet. So the first is actually weight management. People who eat a plant-based diet tend to be substantially leaner than those who don't. Um, and the diet typically makes it much easier to lose weight and keep it off. Um, without really counting calories. And, and some of the effect of this, a lot of the effect of this, is due to the difference in fiber bulk. I mean, in fiber bulk, in order to get enough calories in plant-based diets, you need to eat a, a much, much bigger volume of food. And so people actually feel more full more quickly. And so you end up actually eating much less calories. The second disease uh, is disease prevention, which I've already mentioned. Um, whole food plant-based eating can prevent, um, it can halt, it can even reverse chronic diseases, including heart disease and type 2 diabetes. The third is that eating this way does create a lighter environmental footprint. It puts a lot less stress on the environment because of how many resources it requires to produce some types of food versus plants. Um, it's also substantially cheaper overall. So let's go over some of the disease prevention benefits in more detail. So one of the most well-known benefits of a whole foods plant-based diet is decreased cardiovascular disease. Plant-based diets are really the only diets proven to prevent and reverse heart disease. And there's no other diet approach that can actually make that claim. Um, research has been studying the benefits of plant-based diets pretty much since the 80s. And recent research that was prevented, presented during the 2017 American Heart Association scientific sessions revealed that plant-based diets could really reduce the risk of heart failure by um, about 
amongst people with absolutely no history of heart disease. So this is prevention in anticipation. And that study included 15,000 people over four years, and it compared plant-based plus fish diets to convenience diets. So those are the diets like where people are routinely eating fast food on their way home, or they're eating heavily processed things. They also compared diets where people ate a lot of sugary desserts. So the diet looked fairly normal, but there always was dessert. Um, they also compared Southern USA diet patterns. So I don't know if you've ever been to the South, but they have some very interesting food history there. And so often the Southern diet is substantially more fried and there's some interesting kind of vegetables and stuff that you don't see as much here. And also they compared a diet where there was, where it was, um, the component, main components of them were lots of salads as a vegetable source, but also alcohol. So there were, like I said, five diet groups. And literally what they found was it reduced heart failure by 42% to, um, to eat a plant-based diet. None of the other diets showed any benefit in comparison over that time frame. So many studies have really found that participants who consume a plant-based diet show reversal of coronary artery disease. That means the plaques within their arteries actually start to reverse. So people have asked me this question um, in practice before, like, okay, well, now that I have hardening of the arteries, doesn't it always stay that way? And the answer to that question is no, because every single tissue in your body, every single organ in your body is constantly renewing. Now, some are slower than others, you know, like your skeleton. Your skeleton can take seven, eight years to completely turn over, but your gut wall takes a day. And all the other tissues are kind of in between those two time frames. So it's totally possible to remodel a tissue that's been damaged in the past. And you can fundamentally and, and in a proven way do that with diet. So protective factors are really attributed um, cardiovascularly to both the quality and types of foods consumed. So there was a study in the Journal of American College of Cardiology that actually used 200,000 participants. And they basically followed a healthy plant-based plant -based diet that was rich in all the things that you'd expect, vegetables, fruits, whole grains, legumes, nuts. And they really showed a substantially lower risk of developing heart disease than those following non-plant-based diets. So it's important to note that this study also found unhealthy plant-based diets that included sugary drinks or fruit juices or refined grains were actually associated with a 25% increased risk of heart disease over the plant-based diets, not including those items. So again, the, the risk was substantially reduced. It was very similar to the original 42%. It was close to 40. Um, but even so, even if you were still technically eating vegetarian, if you were eating on only the starch end or the bread end of vegetarian, it's, it wasn't as good of a reduction. It was still definitely a reduction. It's amazing, really, when you think about it, that you can reverse what you've done to your arteries. <laughs> so the next big category is cancer. Um, research does suggest that following a plant-based diet reduces your risk of certain types of cancer in particular. There are, of course, lots of risk factors in the production of cancer, but the effect of diet is clearly evident. Vegetarian diets are associated with significantly lower risk of gastrointestinal um, and colorectal cancer. So gastrointestinal means basically any kind of um, cancer along the digestive tract. So stomach, pancreas, gallbladder, liver, within the um, wall itself, and then all the way into colorectal cancer, which people are more familiar with. So that's colon cancer. Um, and in a large study of about 77,000 Seventh-day Adventists. Now, I don't know if you know who the Seventh-day Adventists are, but they're a religious community based in California, and they were all studied over seven years. Um, now, the thing about Seventh-day Adventists is their community is predominantly vegetarian. This is part of their religious philosophy is that the body is a temple and you should do the healthiest potential diet for it. And they've decided that that's vegetarianism. And so there's a huge pool of people who are Seventh-day Adventists and um, they they get studied a lot. <laughs> in fact, it's one of the only populations in the United States where the life expectancy goes up 
instead of down when they do the USA averages. Um, I don't know if, if any of you have previously attended the um, myths of aging uh, webinars or lectures that I've done in the past. Maybe I'll repeat those um, soon, but um, it's one of the, uh, the best populations in North America for longevity as a Seventh-day Adventist. And part of it is that general intergenerationally now they've been eating vegetarian. Uh, not all of them are vegetarians, but most of them are. In any case, they were studied for seven years and their colorectal cancer risk was reduced by 30% just off the top. And that was just in seven years. Um, there was a study of 61,000 British people over an average of 15 years, so twice as long. And cancers of the lymph system were decreased by 35% in a, just a vegetarian, not even whole foods, plant-based. Stomach cancer by 60%. And multiple myeloma, which is a kind of cancer of the bone marrow, um, by 80%. So the American Cancer Society actually recommends that cancer survivors follow a plant-based diet, basically high in the things that plant-based diets are high in. So fruits and vegetables, unrefined grains, and then being low in red and processed meats. So processed meats are things like bacon and ham, anything that actually requires some um, something to be done to it to be uh, produced for eating, and refined grains and sugars. So that's the American Cancer Society. So a whole foods plant-based diet can really reduce inflammation, it can boost your immune system, it can decrease your body weight. All of those things are associated with reduction of cancer risks. Now granted, this does not take your cancer risk down to zero. You know, again, let's be clear, there's more risk factors than this, but it is really one of the most statistically proven interventions that you can do. Um, as many of you know, I'm also a proponent of matching diets to people. And so um, we can talk about that at a later date. But this particular uh, dietary approach makes a huge difference. Now, diabetes is also a place where a plant-based diet really shines. So if you can adopt that diet, it's it will be a super useful tool in managing your diabetes and also reducing your risk of ever developing diabetes. There's countless studies that have shown the effects between diet and diabetes, but these results are actually really promising. There's a study of more than 200,000 people, also published peer-reviewed weekly medical journal, found that those who adhered to a healthy plant-based eating pattern had a 34% lower risk of di developing diabetes than those who just followed kind of like a more unhealthy non-plant-based diet. Um, similarly, a study published in Diabetes Care demonstrated that plant-based diets were associated with a nearly 50% reduction in the risk of type 2 diabetes compared to non-vegetarian diets. So that's good news for people without diabetes, but there's also some good news for people with diabetes because studies published have found that plant-based studies have been shown to improve blood sugar control in people with diabetes. And in fact, in one study, over 22 weeks of time showed that 43% of people on whole foods plant-based diets as an intervention could reduce their diabetic medications versus 26% of people on the American Diabetes Association diet for the same period. So that's the diet that ostensibly is designed for diabetes. It was clearly almost 20% more effective. Um, women who eat red meat increase their risk of developing diabetes by 40%. Um, and men by 80%. And that effect has actually been shown repeatedly. Although why that's the case is not as clear. It's thought that insulin responses to some of those um, meats is actually as significant, if not more, than uh, carbohydrates. So we kind of have to rethink some of our strategies internally about what a healthy diet actually is. Now, another place that is um, associated with health benefits is the brain. Plant-based diets appear to influence mental health and cognitive function positively. And there's some theories for that. There's some thought that there's higher levels of antioxidants in the blood from plant sources, and that there's a decreased intake of glycotoxins. So that's where you get a toxin from heat processing food. So processed meats and cheeses have things like that in them. Um, and so if you use a plant-based diet, you get a significantly lower risk of depression, a lower suicide rate, um, and 
in all sorts of different kinds of studies. So both cross-sectional where you're actually taking a look at different populations at the same time that are kind of just living independently and also interventional studies. So that means where you actually on purpose go in and change the diet. Vegetarianism shows fewer symptoms of depression, anxiety, stress, and mood disturbance than if somebody is omnivorous in their diet, which is like what I said, what we argue is probably the normal diet of the human being. So what is it? It's probably increases in nutrients, probably decreases in toxins. That's also already shown to, pro to slow the progression of Alzheimer's disease. You can actually reverse a cognitive deficit with that diet. Um, there's countless studies reporting associations between higher intakes of fruits and vegetables and a reduction in cognitive decline. Unfortunately, again, my experience in practice, and um, I don't know if any of you have older parents, but I've been in lots of seniors facilities where there's a real fight for people to eat well in a seniors facility. And part of it can be the, actually the cognition and what people choose. But a lot of the time it's because people feel like they're retired and they just want to eat whatever they want. Um, I have actually spoken to chefs in um, seniors facilities where I had patients and they've often said, you know, I would love it if I could um, feed all of the people in my um, dining room the healthiest stuff, but most of them won't eat it. And so there's, they basically have often come down to just um, fixing people things for meals that they'll actually eat. Um, it's very unfortunate because there's not a really great food culture amongst um, the seniors that are alive right now. And, and that hasn't been the case for, for a while. So unfortunately, if they read the research, and maybe they will, but um, there's at least one meta-analysis of about 31,000 people that actually showed that if you just eat more fruits and vegetables, you'll have a 20% reduction in the risk of developing cognitive impairment or dementia. Um, so in addition, even if you've developed dementia, you'll have a delay in the onset of the condition if you're a plant eater predominantly. So again, thoughts are much higher greens intakes could substantially improve methylation and nervous system function. You have higher levels of antioxidants. You have decreased intake of, of toxins. Um, all around, it's probably a good idea to eat your veggies. <laughs> so I think the evidence is pretty clear. It's definitely a shift towards plant-based eating has a big impact on your health. I mean, if if you actually invented a drug that did that, you would never hear the end of it. There is no single drug that can do anything remotely like those statistics. Even if you put in all of the drugs, you can't reduce it like that. In a, in a relatively healthy person, even in a sick person, if you do one major drug intervention, the maximum impact you're going to have is 25% of the risk usually. And that would be a really good drug for whatever it is that you're using as a, as a measure. Um, but even just diet alone it decreases, usually the decreases are close to twice that. So it's something to really consider. So then probably what you're thinking is, hmm, this is going to be hard work <laughs> or it's going to be boring or, you know, avoiding certain animal ingredients is going to limit your options. And in reality, it does really change the landscape of how you eat. And it definitely takes more work initially because you have to really rethink your normal meal strategies. So this would be your opportunity to become a bit more innovative and you can try and work with new ingredients. You can, I think you get a deeper appreciation for food. So you got to think of this experience as a flavor adventure and also as an opportunity, I think, to challenge some of your ideas about diet. So um, we have had some pre-submitted questions about protein, and I'm, I'm just going to answer this question now because it's one of the questions that comes up most consistently about changing a diet to plant-based. So it's thought that a male needs about um, 0.75 grams of protein per kilo of body weight if you're doing strength training. Some people will say it's a little higher than that, like one gram. Um, but you can pretty easily get that in legumes and nuts and seeds, grains and soy products. So if you're about 150 pounds, that's about two bowls and a bit of cooked legumes per day. Um, cooked, so not like dry two bowls. 
So you've got to remember that you can actually store amino acids. So even if you don't technically have a complete amino acid profile in a meal, so long as you eat a variety of things, chances are quite good you're going to get that range, unless you're very mono, like a very mono eater. And the odd person is, you know, one of the challenges in dietary strategies is that um, you you have to have like this certain, like you have to have this kind of certain plate composition in your mind or, you know, that you need so much more protein than you probably really need. Um, so I don't think that's really true. I think some of those um, estimates are actually overblown. And we're talking about the estimate is 0.75 grams per um, kilo body weight if you're doing strength training. That means you're on purpose trying to build muscle. So the average is probably substantially less than that. Um, there was also a question about what foods to have organic. Um, and the quick answer to that is to actually check the Environmental Working Group's current list of the most contaminated fruits and vegetables and get those organic. And that list is actually updated pretty often. Um, the most recent list includes on the top strawberries. Um, a lot of the time those make the top of the list, actually. Spinach, um, kale, which is a surprise addition. Kale is um, only more recently ended up on that dirty dozen list. And part of that is because kale is so much more popular now that they're struggling to keep up with demand. And so there's lots of non-organic farmers that are throwing their hat in the kale ring. And as a consequence, there's a huge amount of kale being grown with pesticides, which seems counterintuitive because it was really the, like the natural um, foods, nuts that were using it originally, but it's become such a big money maker that there's tons of people growing it non-organically now. Um, nectarines, so uh, a lot of the fruits with stones um, growing on trees will be high pesticide, like high contamination. Apples, um, grapes, grapes, super highly sprayed crop. Peaches and cherries, um, just like I was saying, like those, those stony fruits. Pears are actually sprayed really highly if they're not organic here. Celery, another kind of surprise option because most people think of celery as being the food that's reserved for the vegetarians. <laughs> and yet it's, it can be highly contaminated if not organic. And potatoes, also a bit of a stress, a stressor. Um, if you eat meat and dairy products, they should be organic if you can manage it. Organic or wild. Wild, um, obviously it's harder to get wild, you know, cow, as an example, like beef. You can't really get wild beef unless you go to like the Middle East probably. Um, but uh, organic um, uh, dairy products decreases the amount of pesticide residue. Not so much hormones. In Canada, we don't really allow hormones in dairy products in the same way that they do in the United States. Um, and then anything, like I said, really concentrated, any flesh source will be more concentrated. And so those are better to get organically raised um, where you can. Obviously, it also makes them a lot more expensive. So um, let's take a look at some you know, maybe getting started tips here. So obviously this could be intimidating at first because you're going against sometimes a lot of life training. So instead of focusing on what you shouldn't eat or foods to avoid, it's actually more effective to start including more of the stuff you want to put in. So let's see what we can do here to like make some transitions for you. So the first thing I would recommend patients do is start by just increasing the proportions of veggies and fruits on your plate. Just make more of what you already make for veggies for your meals and then add that in and maybe wiggle down a little bit how much meat you put on the plate because it just takes up, you know, too much space for, takes, occupies veggie space. You could also pick some of the plant-based meals you already eat. You know, some people already eat rice and beans or veggie stir fries or pasta with just tomato sauce. You know, those are already vegetarian. They're not all technically whole foods plant-based, but you can start to make that transition. So sift through your current food routine, pick out a few meatless things you already enjoy and increase the number of times you eat those. And then shift your balance by putting salad greens under your food. That's a super easy way to improve your greens intake, um, which can be really, really useful very quickly. Um, and if you put that, you know, 
organic salad mix under everything on your plate, you kind of end up eating it. <laughs> That's been my experience if I put it underneath people's plates, even if they just come over. They just look at me and then eat it anyway. <laughs> now, the other thing you could do is, you know, find some other plant-based eaters you know invite people that you know to join you to do this you know maybe you have a supportive spouse or you know a, a supportive friend you know it's always easier if you're making these kind of changes to involve other people i also think sometimes there's certain things that you can do that um make it a little bit more fun like get a spiralizer i don't know if anybody in the audience has a spiralizer but man those things are great that can make beets just so entertaining and you know they kind of get them smaller so that you can easily eat them um, mix fruit and vegetables together um, if you roast fruit with veggies lots of people will eat way more vegetables than typical um, I remember once long ago when I lived in England um, we had hosted uh, a man over for dinner who um, really was not a big vegetable eater but i actually didn't know that in advance and i had roasted red peppers with plums in the oven and put it together because you know they're both kind of a bit sweet and it was they melt the flavors meld nicely together and so i put that in with whatever else we were eating at the time i can't remember but he ate like two or three servings of it and his wife's jaw was on the floor because she was like why won't you eat red peppers at home and he's like well they don't taste like these red peppers and so sometimes it's just learning how to take advantage of the food that um and and what its innate tastes are like and people really enjoy um obviously sweet tastes but in essence that's a very nice way of rounding out vegetables so sometimes if people find vegetables a little hard to take if you mix certain kinds of slightly hardier fruits in there that works just fine um, also, you know, you can switch out products that are flour based um, and start to put grains instead in whole form. So there's lots of different grains you can use as a base or you can mix them in with greens like in a salad. So get used to using more brown rice or farro. I don't know if you've seen farro, but that's kind of like um, a wheat kernel looking thing. It's, it's a specific kind. It's called farro. You can easily find it um at our local health food stores um also you could try amaranth you can try quinoa um you can try millet um and a grain prepared in this way actually has a very different biological effect than the flour does um and there's there's lots of theories as to why that is but obviously you're you're grinding it down you're changing sometimes how exposed to air it is a little bit different if you actually grind your own flowers in the moment um, and I don't know if you've ever tried to do that you can get a, a flour mill for the KitchenAid like the front as an accessory to your KitchenAid if you have one and you can um, easily grind your own grain it just has a totally different taste and texture and it's very fresh the problem with a lot of flowers um, especially the whole grain ones just so you know is that they go rancid pretty fast so you gotta like grind that and use it you don't want to grind it and like leave it around in a drawer um, in fact if you have whole meal flowers you, you're going to want to keep them in the freezer when you can because um, it'll prevent all those oils from going bad um, and then also another thing that you could potentially do is start using oil very sparingly as a spray in the full whole meal um, or whole foods plant-based diets there's actually very little oil that goes in. Um, and, you know, I think we make arguments for and against oils at different times and different kinds of oils. Um, but in that particular approach, they prefer you to not use any oil, especially in cardiovascular rehabilitation. So let's see, what other kind of ideas can we do? I think, you know, most people think a plant-based is adding a salad. <laughs> and yes, adding salad does help and like I said if you underpin things with greens it helps a lot but there's so many interesting fruits and vegetables and grains that you just a little bit of creativity and openness goes a long way so some more ideas that I can think of roast root vegetables um, roasting actually tends to bring out the flavor and bring out the sweetness a lot of, of um, vegetables especially things that are roots it, it actually develops the flavor a lot more and so sometimes you know a kid won't eat a like a 
steamed carrot, but they'll eat a roasted one. Um, and then if you can start to add beans or lentils or pulses to your food, um, a little in the beginning, because sometimes it'll take a little bit of time for your digestion to adjust to that. You might have to use some enzymes temporarily to kind of catch up to that. Um, but if you learn how to just add them into salads, put them in as a side dish, start to make salads out of them, you'd be surprised how much of an impact that can have on making you feel more full and it's not super high calorie. Um, you can learn to throw in pine nuts, flax seeds, um, nuts like Brazil nuts and walnuts have been, have some really great clinical, um, in evidence in favor of their use. Um, they're just like little small boosters to what you're already doing. Add fresh herbs wherever you can. They have huge amounts of nutrients in them. So when you have like fresh parsley, um, turmeric, you have like any of the green leafy herbs, actually, any of the ones that are ground, you'd be surprised actually at what's in spices, especially ones that you get whole and or fresh and grind or chop yourself. Um, also, also, I think they make a much bigger flavor impact if they're not pre-ground and stuck in a jar and, and in the drawer for five years. <laughs> so same problem with flowers, right? Anytime you grind something, you lose the aromatics, you lose some of the taste. And a lot of time people don't even realize that the freshly ground thing tastes so much different. Um, in September, we're actually going to do a whole webinar on food prep. So I can give you way more information about this topic than I think it's in September, actually. Yeah, September. So watch for that. Hopefully you are pre-registered for some of those things already. Now, the other thing you can do is start to pull food items out of your kitchen that are really processed. So some great examples of that. Processed breakfast cereal. No good real reason to eat that, actually. <laughs> so, you know, it's much better to use a whole grain cereal that you make yourself um, or a cooked cereal. Um, you know, if you don't have time for cooked cereal in the morning, you can always overnight it in the slow cooker. Um, if people have like Instapots and things like that nowadays, people have invested in Instapots, they'll make hot cereal in a very short window of time. Next thing, get rid of canned beverages, like all those things where you have all the refined sugars in them. Um, I know people still drink them because, you know, there's again, childhood associations with that. Um, also crackers and chips, huge sources of processed oils and grains. And a lot of times they'll have, you know, a lot of dairy products and eggs in them. So you can start to reduce their use. I mean, it's never like you're not going to eat a cracker again, but, you know, consider maybe some of the plant-based ones. You can even get plant-based breads. Um, you know, they're totally available in the store. A lot of the time they're labeled like that. Um, get some less refined sweeteners if you're a big sugar user. So you can use maple syrup instead or molasses. Um, you could use stevia, which arguably is a little bit more refined, but basically that's an amino acid from, from plant substances that has a sweet taste to it. Um, you can use coconut palm sugar, hopefully orangutan friendly coconut palm sugar. I don't know if you've heard of that <laughs> sweetener or not. It's kind of a brownish, um, powder, not overwhelmingly sweet, but still sweet enough, you know, to use in, um, in recipes. So, if you can manage to do that, you know, stocking your pantry like that is really going to help you to include more plant-based things. You might also want to invest in a juicer or a blender or an immersion blender. Immersion blenders are great for liquefying things. So it can help make a sauce that isn't dairy-based or isn't oil-based if you have an immersion blender and you can whip something up really, really fine. Um, I am in love with my immersion blender and I like to immersion blend all things, <laughs> including soups are really good too, especially in winter time. If you want to make like a, um, a vegetable soup, that's really smooth. Um, an immersion blender basically is a stick blender that's high power. So, but you can make a lot of different things with that without trying very hard. I think too, a big challenge in this kind of diet is shopping. Um, some people really dread shopping for new things and will actually actively avoid <laughs> doing that. Um, so you, you sometimes have to find somebody in the store that knows what you're looking for. Um, and you know, I think it's a good argument for click and collect. You know, I, I personally love like grocery delivery systems and like where I go and pick stuff up. Sometimes I don't have time. I don't know how busy you guys are, but sometimes I really don't have time for grocery shopping when I mean, that can take hours. So I just pay somebody to go and do it, you know, at click and collect at Superstore that costs you like five bucks in prime time. 
and they will go and like choose everything off your list for you and they do a really good job of you know getting produce and um, I usually get it there because there's lots of natural foods there um, and a good sec selection of organic there so you can actually get a lot of the, what you might need there and surprisingly they have huge numbers of international foods so you know make it easier for yourself plan a like a meal and gather up a few recipes know what ingredients you need um, and then see if you can um, uh, get everything off the list and then then it'll be easier to try things over the course of the, of, of the week so I typically list out items like by by the periphery of the store i'm not a big center of the store shopper um so if you stick to the perimeter you're going to eat the things most of the time that are much healthier for you anyways <laughs> you're getting away from the processed stuff and if you are starting to get bored with like or if you only have so many flavors in your own foods that you're familiar with making expand your shopping to like local ethnic markets you know there's lots most asian cultures have tons of vegetarian or vegan based recipes you can start to incorporate and you can even find products that aren't effort uh, like offered in your regular grocery store like around the corner for me is something called dalbrant spice rack they have like all sorts of spices you have never heard of <laughs> sometimes you know you just need to add a new flavor in um, you can also really try here especially in calgary you can get local produce um, they're going to be fresher. They're going to have less chemical exposure. They have a lower environmental impact because, you know, the average grocery cart, um, if you really calculate it out, you know, a lot of those, the average kilometers of, of travel that some of those things make is 1,600 kilometers, especially in the off season. I actually personally get a community supported agriculture share. So I get a box weekly for the, uh, for the entire season from my local biodynamic farm. And that really can induce creativity with vegetables because what you get is what's coming off the field that week. So you start to learn how to make things that, um, that are a bit of a surprise to you every week. And I think before you go shopping, you have to kind of build in some food prep um, for when you get all that stuff home. You're a lot more likely to use produce if it's ready to go. Um, just make a habit of washing and cutting everything before you put it away. Um, you know, a lot of us really are prevented by time for cooking fresh meals. But if you do a whole bunch of the prep ahead of time and you know exactly what's in the fridge, it makes it a lot easier. So get yourself some good glass containers. You know, most things will last about uh, a week and a half in the fridge, sometimes a little longer. And of course, the root vegetables and stuff uh, quite a bit longer. So recipes. I think one of the my my all time favorite book is the Moosewood Restaurant Cookbook. That's actually a vegetarian restaurant in New York. And it has just a ton of recipes, all sorts of different ethnic influences. It really introduced me when I was in naturopathic school to things that I had never heard of. I mean, I came from Alberta and <laughs> I went to Washington State to a school that was basically vegetarian. I, I mean, that was like just a huge shocker for me. So if you find yourself in that position of like, wow, how am I going to do that? I can totally empathize with that. I went from the steak eating German culture, <laughs> you know, to vegetarian cafeteria. So it was a huge culture shock and it took me a while to figure out how to do it in a way that was really balanced. Um, and, and that book was really crucial, but there's lots of recipes that you can get, you know, Epicurious has tons of whole foods, plant-based recipes. You can actually just, um, put that in as a search term or vegetarian forks over knives is another great resource site. Now forks over knives is, um, a book that was written and a documentary that was produced that is basically about the whole foods, plant-based diets. And you can get tons of like burrito bowl recipes and easy Thai noodles, all of those kinds of recipes. Um, they even, I even have a picture here of like the no tuna salad sandwich. So basically it's a chickpea um, based sandwich. Now here they're using like Ezekiel bread. I don't know if you've heard of that, but that's like a sprouted bread that's not really flour based. Um, so you can do all sorts of interesting things with food. And sometimes it actually can get you a little bit excited to try new things. So let's just talk about a couple more points here. So just a word on supplements. So I think personally getting your nutritional needs from supplements is, it's tempting, but supplements are not as good as food. 
they just can't replicate all the nutrients and benefits of whole foods. Now, there's going to be times where you're going to need supplementation because there's a disease process going on or you're trying to support the function of something that's not doing very well. But if you're relatively healthy and you eat well, dietary supplements, most of them are not going to be worth the expense unless they're very targeted. Um, you can get whole food supplements. Um, so that's like whole, like superfoods and concentrated um, foods kind of ground down and put into various applications. Those ones actually ha have shown to be much perform much, much better than the average multivitamin. If you're going to, you know, put some money into supplementation, that's the kind of supplementation in general that you're going to want to aim at because it can fill gaps in a diet, especially if you're not super creative in the, in the veggies department. But if you do have the whole foods, you're basically going to get better in nutrition. You know, a, a great example is vitamin C. Vitamin C in a capsule is ascorbic acid. That's how it's sold. Um, there's one producer of vitamin C in the, in the world. Um, the main producer of vitamin C in the world for all the pharmaceutical companies, for all of the, um, pharmaceutically owned nutritional supplement companies. And let me tell you, there's lots of them. Um, they all use ascorbic acid from the same source. But in nature, vitamin C isn't just ascorbic acid by itself. It's ascorbic acid and 22 other cofactors. And they're, of course, found in the food where the vitamin C is. So if you actually use a food-based vitamin C, like an acerola cherry um, or a sago palm vitamin C, um, those will have the ascorbic acid, but they're also going to have those 22 other cofactors. And so you end up having to use less of it and it's more efficient. So that's true for many different nutrients, not just vitamin C. Also, whole foods are going to have a lot of dietary fiber. That is very hard to make up in a supplement. Um, there's just mixes of soluble and soluble fibers. I mean, yes, you could, you know, try to increase your fiber intake. Um, by like supplementally sticking fiber in, but it's much easier to just get it from a food source. Also, there's tons of protective substances that you can get in food that you're not going to get in a capsule, or if you are going to get them in a capsule, they're going to be super expensive. Like um, the colored compounds that are found in fruit, they're all in the bioflavonoid category. So, you know, everybody's excited about collagen right now. Collagen, you can't actually absorb collagen without digesting it. Um, meaning that you actually have to break it completely down. You can't just take collagen in and like insert it into your body. <laughs> That's not possible. Um, you don't have a mechanism for doing that. You can use the, you know, amino acids from the collagens that you eat to build your own. For sure you can. But one of the biggest limiting factors in collagen repair are bioflavonoids. So um, all of those compounds that you find like high in certain herbal um, like other plants, basically medicinal plants, um, are plant-based medicines and they, they can be used as foods, you know, things like the dark berries or horse chestnut, or like you can make teas and supplements, obviously of those things, but those bioflavonoids are the things that actually help you cross link collagen structures and they make them substantially tougher. So if you have varicose veins, don't eat collagen, eat bioflavonoids eat horse chestnut bioflavonoids, you'll get much, much um, better symptom relief. And it's basically a food substance is what you're putting in. It's a plant-based food substance. So there's quite a few documentaries um, that you can watch to get more information about this. But like I said, Forks Over Knives is probably one of the better ones that's um, been made. And so that it just basically looks at the relationship between plant-based diets and managing disease. And there's a website there that also um, gets you lots of valuable resources for, for recipes. And there's a bunch of other books that you could potentially take a look at. There's a great book that I like the title of this book. It's called How, How Not to Die by Michael Greger. It's G-R-E-G-E-R. -E -E um, the China Study that I already mentioned, that's by uh, T. Colin Campbell. Um, the Mind Gut Connection, that's by Amarin Mayer. Um, a Plant-Based Life which is a complete guide to great food, radiant health, et cetera, et cetera. That's by Mike, Michaela Carlson with a K. Um, the Omnivore's Dilemma, A Natural History of the Four Meals by Michael Pollan. That's an interesting book. Uh, the Plant-Based Solution, that's by Joel Kahn, who's an MD. Um, you can also see the website Meatless Monday for all sorts of information and recipes about how to include more plants. Um, you can use the Food Monster app or the Kitchen Stories app 
these are all resources that you can use to just start thinking, how am I going to get more plants in? Thanks for watching. I love to connect with my patient community to inform and inspire, and I hope you'll join us again in the near future. See you soon.